guess it's safe to poke fun at myself if you notice the slide. I don't know where anywhere is. I know where anywhere is. So Mike, we're even. Mike texted me his songs, and the first song he had 590 verse Q. So I knew he meant verse 1, so hopefully those keep being close together and fat fingers uh, with a typo. We want to continue this morning in our study in the book of Acts. As we have seen the conversions of multitudes, last week we examined the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And as we looked at the eunuch, I believe we turn from that conversion, Brother John, Sister Gwen, it is good to see you this morning. And I'm sorry I didn't see them back there, but I want to say how good it is to see them out. And I want to recognize them for being with us. But anyway, we go from the conversion of the unit to perhaps what I would say, and what many consider to be the most famous conversion in all of the book of Acts. And that is the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who, as Brother Costello read for us in those first six verses, seemed to be the chief persecutor of the early church, who, as we know, later became Paul the Proclaimer, perhaps the greatest preacher and evangelist in the early church. And so this conversion of Saul it reaches out and it shows us and it gives us a very powerful testimony, a very powerful message about the resurrection of Jesus. And I believe not only can we see that in the book of Acts, but as we go through the writings of Paul and the other books that he wrote for us, we see he focuses on the resurrection very heavily. And we're going to look at at least one of those passages as we close our lesson this morning. But in the scripture, in the book of Acts, there are three accounts of this conversion. The first account is recorded here in Acts chapter 9, the first 19 verses. As it is Luke recording through inspiration exactly what happened. And then you go over to Acts chapter 22, beginning verse 6 and down to verse 16. Here you will see Paul as he stands before this large crowd, that superstitious crowd, mind you. And Paul himself recounts and he gives his version of his conversion. And then lastly in Acts chapter 26, beginning in verse 12 down through verse 18. Here it is, Paul is standing before King Agrippa. And it is in that passage that Paul gives a defense of who he is, and he gives a, an account of his conversion. And what I want us to understand this morning is what we find from the conversion of Saul. Not only do we, are we going to see that it's that powerful testimony and statement about the resurrection of Jesus, but it is going to give us more evidence concerning the nature of conversions as they are revealed in the book of Acts. And really at the end of our lesson, in the second part, we're going to focus on two thoughts. Because this passage should clear up all confusion that exists in the world today about when, when one is saved. And it also will tell us how one is saved. If we will just let the scriptures do the teaching, not mere mortal men. And my goal this morning is to share with you exactly what the Bible says. Because as I said earlier in our announcements, that's what we're here for. Is to do all things according to the will of God. And so, as you think about when Saul was saved, and I'm going to throw the teasers out to you, the question is, was he saved on the road to Damascus when the Lord appeared to him? Or was he saved in, in Damascus at some point after he arrived? And then that question, we have a second question we'll answer is, how was Saul saved? 
Was he saved by saying the sinner's prayer? Or saying any type of prayer for that matter? Or was he saved by being baptized? So as we first want to do, let's look at a harmony of his conversion. And I'm going to be flipping back and forth from Acts 9 to Acts 22 to Acts 26. I'm probably not going to read all of those passages to you. But it is in those three accounts that we can see the complete story, the complete narrative of Paul's conversion. First of all, we see that he went to the chief priests, or the high priests. And what did he specifically ask for in verse 2? He asked for letters that he might take them to the synagogue in Damascus, that he might find those, and notice the King James and New King James say that he was looking for those who were of, quote, the way. I find that interesting. How does Luke record for us that Saul was seeking those who were of the way. Brother, that is just another way of confirming the words of Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 6. You remember those words, right? Jesus himself said, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. Here when it says, of those who were of the way, it is making reference to those who were believing that Jesus was the way, was the truth, and is the light. It is a correlation to confirm what Scripture teaches. And we know that he was going there for this exact purpose to persecute Christians. And not only to persecute them, but notice it says that he was going to bring them back bound to Jerusalem. He was going to bring them back really for a trial for being of the way. He was going to allow that trial to take place that they might be either in prison, that they might be murdered, martyred might be the right word, and we can go on and on and talk about that. But as he's traveling, we see that suddenly there around him came this bright light. Again, let me take you back to John 14. Jesus said he was what? The light. Here we see an instance of Jesus proving he is the light. And you have to continue reading on down through there to see who is speaking to Saul to show that it is Jesus who is the light. And that voice began to speak. And in verse 4 says, the voice cried out, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting? Notice the word. It doesn't say, why are you persecuting the people. It says, why are you persecuting me? Jesus, as he's speaking, says, when individuals are persecuted in his name, they are persecuting Jesus himself. We see that every day. When people persecute us for our belief and for our thoughts of following after Jesus. They may be persecuting us, but remember, they are persecuting Jesus through us. And so he goes on. You look at Paul's response in verse 5. I hadn't thought a whole lot about this, Chip, until this week. And it's interesting to me Saul cries out and says, Who are you, Lord? Why would Paul or Saul cry out, Who are you, Lord, if he did not have some knowledge of who Jesus was? That's my question. 
Saul had an understanding of who Jesus was. However, his understanding of who Jesus was was a misunderstanding. Remember, Paul was skilled in the law. He knew about the coming Christ. Yet from the evidence we see in this passage, he had rejected Jesus. So Jesus answered him and said, I am Jesus. I am the one who you have knowledge of through the knowledge you have of the old law. And then Jesus tells him, here's why I appear to you. I appear to you because you are persecuting me. And then he goes on. In the very next verse, I still read in verse 6. After he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? In other words, Saul was saying, what do I need to do to become right in your sight? What, what do you want me to do? Jesus answers the question. And brother, understanding the words of Jesus here is the key to understanding when Saul was saved and how Saul was saved. Okay? This question that he asked and the answer Jesus gave is the key to this whole passage about the conversion of Saul. Jesus says, Arise, go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. You go to the city, and you will be told what you need to do to become right in my sight. You go into the city and you will be told what you must do to be saved. That's the question. And the rest of this passage in Acts chapter 9, as you go on down through verse 19, is how you get to the answers to the questions we want to answer this morning. Notice then, it's all gets up. His eyes were open, and he saw the Lord. His eyes were open, but he was blind. He could not see. Notice what happened. He says, they led him by the hand and brought him to the masters. I remember about 11 and a half years ago, or somewhere in that neighborhood, Perhaps those of you who were here remember that sermon that I preached on Help Me Get to Heaven. Help me on my journey of salvation. There's biblical proof that we need each other. Saul had someone or someones to help him get to the city so that he would know what to do. And as he goes here, we continue on. He was there three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. What did Saul do for three days and three nights? What did he do? Was he fasting? Possibly. Was he praying? Possibly. I think that's all included in here. But then you go on and then you see that the Lord sends Ananias. And Ananias went to him and said, In a vision, Ananias, and he said, Hear my Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas. For one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, there's the answer, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his son. But what happens? Ananias answered and said, Lord, I've heard many things about this man. I've heard about what he has done and how much harm he has done to the church in Jerusalem. To me, Ananias sounds a lot like a young man, a gentleman that we read about in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. You might remember his name, Moses. 
when God appeared to him in the burning bush. And you remember he told us, I want you to go in to the Pharaoh in Egypt, and I want you to tell him three words, four words. Let my people go. Perhaps you have a good memory, and you remember. Immediately, what did Moses begin to do? He began to make excuses. Brother Ananias was making excuses. And his excuses had about as much weight as the excuses of Moses. Because for every excuse one makes, God always has an answer, doesn't he? God always has the answer when you and I try to make excuses. And so Ananias goes to him finally, and he tells him, and he restores his sight. And he tells him why the Lord appeared to him, and how that Saul would become a witness of what he has seen. And he tells him, here's what you must do. Remember Saul asked that question. In Acts 22, verse 16, hopefully it's a passage we know of. And I said, Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it is at this point that Paul breaks his fast and he spends some time with the disciples who are assembled in Damascus. But now let's go, let's go answer our two questions. And these are some observations. First of all, we ask the question, when was Saul saved? Some state, in a prevalent thought in the religious world today, is that Saul was saved on the road to Damascus. He was saved when Jesus appeared to him in a vision. They say his conversion took place at that very moment. Now I'm just a simple-minded individual. I'm not overly educated. But rather, even I can see from Acts chapter 9, that that is not what took place. I can see that he was not saved the moment he saw the vision. He was not saved as he was traveling on the road to Damascus. Else why would he have asked the question, what do I need to do? If he had already been saved, it would have been a dumb question. It would have been an irrelevant question. Why would Jesus, have, would Jesus have said, you need to go and it will be told what you must do if he was already saved? A little simple as a brother. I just I have a hard time with that. I have a hard time why people don't understand the simplicity of the scriptures. When it makes its own commentary on itself, even within this passage. You see, Saul was not saved until he arrived in Damascus. Not on the road. The Lord said it was in Damascus that you would be told. It was in Damascus, as we've already seen, that Ananias told him to arise and be baptized and wash away his sin. Up to the point of his baptism, he was still in his sins. In other words, until he was baptized, he was not saved. I don't know how much simpler we can answer the question when Saul was saved than by looking at what the Bible says. But then the second question comes up that we mentioned earlier. And that is, how was Saul saved? 
How was he saved? Well, again, applying the simplicity of God's word. And let's remember something. I should have pointed this out. The King James Version, the scripture as a whole, is written on about a sixth grade education level. I'm not sure sixth graders today can understand it because I'm not sure what they're being called. But back in the day, sixth graders could understand what Scripture was saying. They were able to develop their own thinking and their own mindsets. They weren't force-fed something to believe something. That's what's wrong with our world today. Critical thinking skills. Being able to think on your own has disappeared. We want to take the words of someone else. And we want to believe that it's fact. I'll stand right here this morning and tell you something. I don't want you to take my words and consider them to be facts. Because I want my words to be backed up by the authority of God's word. I want my words, I want myself to be the oracle or the mouthpiece of God. I want to speak His Word that you might believe in it, not in some mere man. But then Ananias, as we look at how Saul was saved, it's very simple. His statement where he says, baptize and wash away your sins. What we learn is that Saul was not saved in the vision that he saw on the road to Damascus. Saul had not been saved in the three days in which he was praying and fasting. Saul was saved when his sins were washed away. And that occurred after he spent three days in Damascus. That occurred after he spent three days praying and fasting. That occurred when he was baptized into Christ. And I know that somebody may be watching, and somebody here. Brother Ray, you're teaching water baptism. You're teaching water salvation. I'm proud to teach water salvation. Because it is only in the water of baptism where the detergent is found. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ which washes away your and my sin. That's the only place that one's sins can be washed away. We saw last week in the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch that pouring, that sprinkling is not enough for a cleansing. We read and we read, I mean, we read that Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water. By the way, I challenge folks to come to me and tell me how both individuals could fit into a glass of water. Guess what, Mike? And nobody came to me and, and told me how that could happen. The only way two could go down into the water is if there's plenty of water. And that would be enough water for an individual to be covered. We'll talk about that at the close of our lessons from Romans chapter 6. Saul was only saved when he was baptized to wash his sins away. But I think where the religious world gets its confusion comes when Ananias tells Saul at the end of verse 16 in Acts 22, calling upon or on the name of the Lord. Back in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, after quoting Joel, who wrote about calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved, what did Peter do? How did he tell them to call on the name of the Lord? Go back over there to Acts 2 and begin reading, first of all, verse 31. 
This is coming from Joel. He, for saying this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And then you drop down to verse 37, where it says, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then the answer given in verse 38, Men and brethren, let every one of you repent and what? Be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, to the Holy Spirit. Calling on the name of the Lord is making the appeal that you need to be in the right relationship, that you know that it is through repentance and confession and baptism you're calling upon the Lord to wash away your sins. Ananias commanded him to be baptized. He commanded him to call on the name of the Lord. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. If you flip over there, notice what he says. He goes on and he speaks about this. 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 21. It says, if I can get there, that's second Peter. There is also an antitype which now saves us. An antitype. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You go back up in that passage in 1 Peter and you will see that he is talking about in verse 20 the long suffering that God had during the days of Noah. And then he talks about the antitype. How was Noah saved? Noah was saved by his faith in knowing that God said he was going to destroy the world by flood. Now last night some of us may have thought that the world was going to be destroyed by flood. But God promised he's not going to destroy the world by the flood of water again. But when he destroys the world the second time, it's going to be a flood of When Peter speaks of this antitype, it is baptism which saves us. So in baptism, it is there that we are calling upon the name of the Lord. Because we realize our condition. We realize we need to be forgiven of our sins. And we know they need to be washed away. And so let's bring it, let's bring it to a close. From the conversion of Saul, I believe that we learn these two things. One, visions of the Lord will not save you. Have a question. Who could have a vision more impressive than this all? Who could have a vision more impressive than this all? Well, we see, you mentioned, we see visions throughout the scripture, but I don't know if any compared to Saul's. Because it was through that, the, that vision that he became Paul the plan. It was through that vision that he was able to be obedient to the word. And brethren, saying the sinner's prayer will not save you. The scripture says that he had been praying for three days. Three days? He didn't say some prayer that led him to salvation. It's not there. No one that I've spoken to in challenge can show me where you find the sinner's prayer being prayed in Scripture for one who obtains salvation. Brother, that is a man-made doctrine that is contrary to what this passage and what other passages in the book of Acts teach us about conversion. I think I've mentioned this before. I have a chart, and maybe I'll put it up here sometime. But in every case of conversion in the book of Acts, occasionally we read about faith. Occasionally we read about confession. 
Occasionally we read about repentance. But in every case of conversion in the book of Acts, we read about baptism. I'm not trying to negate the importance of faith, repentance, and confession. What I'm trying to show you is baptism is what saves you, not those three preceding things. In keeping what is called elsewhere in Scripture, we see that one is baptized for the remission of their sins. Acts 2, verse 38. We see that we are baptized to have our sins washed away. Acts 22, verse 16. We see that one is baptized to have an appeal to God for a good conscience. Verse Peter 3. Now let's turn back and turn over to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 down through verse 7. Yes, I want to take time to read that. Where the scripture says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized in Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed of sin. What is Paul saying? He's recounting here about his conversion in Romans chapter 6. He first of all says that we are baptized, we are buried with him. What is burial? Burial is what? If I was to go up to the average person and I asked them that question, what does it mean to be buried? Brother Kenny, what are they going to tell me? They're going to tell me that means to be all the way under in coat. Paul says we are at the time. We are, a better word to put there is we are immersed, which means we are put under. And then he goes on, and secondly, he says that we are united with Christ in the likeness of his death. Brethren, it is in baptism that we are united with Christ in his death. Not that we have the same death, but we are united in him because of his death. We are crucified with Christ. And the body of sin is done away. We're six. And we die to sin. Therefore, we are free from sin. Brother, I'm thankful that the passage in Acts chapter 9 records for us what we must do to be saved. I'm thankful for the Apostle Paul as he laid the came. I'm thankful he relates to us and it is related to us in three different passages about his conversion. Did you notice the one thing about those three instances of conversion? There's never a contradiction. Paul stands firm on how he was converted. This morning we may have one in our midst who's not a member. Christ. And through seeing the example of Saul this morning in what he did, you too want to obtain your salvation. You want to be freed from your sin. That's only possible because you have had faith in who Jesus is. 
you're willing to repent to say, I don't want to live the way I was. That's what Saul did. He didn't want to live the life of the persecutor anymore. You're willing to confess, as Saul did in this passage, who are you? What do you want me to do? And then we know that he was told what to do, and then it was the baptism that the sin was taken away. And what was great? We're ready. Or this morning, if you've done that and you've turned your back on the Lord, and you've gone back into the way of sin, we pray this morning that you will come. You will ask for forgiveness of sin that you will need to confess and to repent of. Will you let us pray with you and pray for you? Let us be the ones as Saul had, that led him on the journey to Damascus. Because if you are in sin today as a member of the body of Christ, you are as blind as Paul or as Saul was in this passage. And you need someone to help you. And that's why we are here as your church family. Because we want all to do it. This morning, if you have a need, our prayers you come on the stand. Thank you.